Okay, here we are. I feel very privileged and humbled as usual to share the Word of God with you. Today's passage ends with a, a very startling verse. <clears throat> ends with these words, If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. This verse brings to mind a question <clears throat> that we might like to ponder as we start this morning. Um, and here it is. Uh, which is worse or what's worst? To not know Jesus if he is in fact real or to believe in him and find out that he is in fact not. I'm playing off what Paul said at the end about who is most to be pitied. Made me wonder, who is he comparing with? You know, who else could be pitied that would be pitied less? And you wouldn't be a total looney tune if you, um, if you thought that Paul might have nominated as most to be pitied those who are lost and never knew Jesus. I mean, after all, they are in the darkness. They haven't seen the light. They have no sure purpose or actual assurance of life after death beyond wishful thinking. They have morals, but no authority for them. They still carry guilt, but have no path to forgiveness, except to, to bank on the possibility, the chance, that there might be a God who is not caring that much about justice. But more than anything, they miss out on Jesus because they don't miss him. But they will not miss out on hellfire. But look, both groups in this hypothetical are eternally lost. So that part really is a toss-up. But then you're left to decide, here's kind of one way of thinking about it, whether it's worse to be born blind and then never see a sunset in the face of loved ones, maybe not even know what you're missing, or worse to be struck blind, blind later, at least having seen the world of colors and shapes and sunrises and all of that and visual beauties. But if you, actually, if you vote for born blind, you know, as what's worse, then I would think Paul would disagree. As unspeakably terrible as it is to never know Jesus at all, Paul says there is something worse. And we're going to find out what that is. We're going to try to discern why. Paul might think that way, and why we might think that way. Well, today we discover that this chapter that we're studying is not primarily about the resurrection of Christ. I mean, I know that's hard to believe after, you know, after reading verses 1 through 11 and hearing a sermon on that and all the evidence of, of Christ. I mean, the first 11 verses, all about the gospel, how Jesus came and was crucified for us. He died according to the scriptures, was buried, how he came alive from the dead and all of that. And you would assume that Paul had some kind of inside info that, um, that some of the people in the church at Corinth were kind of a wobbling or getting a little shaky on their belief in the gospel, specifically the bodily resurrection of Christ. But they weren't. That was not the problem. And as we read and keep reading in this chapter, we're going to find out that Paul was concerned about something else that they were misbelieving. And it wasn't Christ's resurrection, but it was something that jeopardized a belief in Christ's resurrection. Well, for some reason or reasons um, not entirely known, some of the people were saying that there would be no bodily resurrection after people die, not even for Christians. Uh, Jesus may have been resurrected, but we won't be. And Paul's point is going to be simply this, that that won't wash, that does not compute. You lose one, you lose the other. So let's just go right into it, starting in verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed, literally being proclaimed as raised from the dead, which, of course, he is proclaimed and he was raised, proclaimed by whom? By every witness, real Christian witness at that time and hopefully today, proclaimed in all sincerity and faith. And then he asks the question, if we're going to preach Jesus that way and, and truly believe it and all of that, then how, which is... He's not really asking for an answer. This is a how, the, the how of astonishment. How in the world, how on earth can some, some, not all of you, but how can some of you be saying, claiming, holding, teaching as true that there is no such thing as resurrection of the dead? Now that question is followed by a statement, a reverse statement that shows why he's astonished. And it's a logic thing. He says, but look, 
If there is no such thing as resurrection of the dead, and between the lines you have to read, and if we know that Jesus at one point was actually dead, uh, a dead human being, then what's the result of that? Then not even Christ has been raised. It's just pure logic. Well, Paul is pretty sure that they don't want to live with that conclusion, and that's why he says it. He's already said that they received the gospel, that they stand in it. That means so much to them. So why are you playing around with this doctrine when it makes this one look untrue? But he's not done talking about that. Now, before I go on with the logic of that and we go through the passage, I want us to realize that what they were claiming by there not being a resurrection was not that there wasn't an afterlife, uh, like there's no hope of, of you know, something after death. No, they seem to have thought that our eternal existence would be purely spiritual, no bodies allowed, just you know, millions of floating souls. And I thought about that. You know, to be honest, there's a certain draw to that. You know, if you don't think too deeply, uh, some of us may not be all that sad to say farewell to these bodies. Mine right now I would be happy to do without. Uh, but, you know, no more weight watching, you know, the incessant rolling out of the newest fad diet, no more, you know, think of, you could smile at an eternity with no more commercials with Marie Osmond telling you how to say bye-bye to stubborn belly fat. And then no more physical comparisons and all of that. No, who's tall, who's short, you know, assuming that souls come in one size fits all. Uh, and no more time-consuming grooming, you know, crowding, crowding in and competing for the bathroom mirror. Um, and it's logical that all eternal souls are bald anyway, because we're told that there we will never part. Um, and then there are no more elbow in the ribs from your wife, because um, no elbows, no ribs. No wives either, although that's a subject for another day. <laughs> and of course, you would never get hungry, although you would forever be separated from lasagna and pumpkin pie and Snickers bars. But if you think a little deeper, which I assume you will, especially with your Bible open, I think you realize that being human was never a soul without a body. Not even from the very beginning. God constructed Adam as a two-part creature. There's never been a human being that we know of that was just a spirit and not a body. God carefully formed Adam's body from dust, a good and perfect anatomy. Before there was ever a sin, there's no sin involved in it whatsoever, before there was ever a fall or a death, and then God blew into Adam's body his own breath, and then it says so clearly, and the man became a living soul or person. Evidently, a good and righteous human could and should be both physical and spiritual. There's nothing in the rest of the Bible to reverse that impression. Therefore, Jesus comes. He was sent to redeem us by taking our place as a perfect representative human. So he had to take on a body, Christmas time, Virgin Mary, you know, the whole thing. Um, complete with elbows and ribs and all the normal parts, including good red precious blood that he could shed on the cross. I'm going to sit here a little differently. I have to tell people that are listening to this that I've, uh, that I've had hip surgery and I'm doing pretty well. So thank the Lord for that, but this chair is not great. So anyway, so Christ came, and he came to redeem human beings, and that meant their bodies, not just their souls. So you can say something like this, glorify God with your body. Because your body came from him, and it's meant to even as a, an aspect of worship. It is a temple of the Holy Spirit. In fact, thinking back to Christ, it was the earliest test of, or, test of orthodoxy. It was not whether Jesus was God, but whether Jesus had actually come in the flesh. In other words, was he fully human as well as divine? Well, here's Paul with the Corinthians. He's trying to teach them and correct them. And um, these people think that the future might not include bodies and where did the mis that misconception come from? Well, there's pages and pages of this in the, in the discussions on this, and I actually uh, don't think I want to repeat hardly any of that, but many scholars think that these people were just under the influence of philosophers. Philosophers like Plato, you've heard of Platonism. You know, the idea of, thing is, of something is of greater value than the thing itself, the material thing. Um, and so there was this idea, kind of the over-spiritualizing, I think, of life, that you it's kind of cool to look down on the body. I mean, the body has limits. It has weaknesses. It even has sins. It's got it's all of its stinky functions and its common pains. And, you know, and it's just its crass materiality. 
we'd be better off without it. And it's not very sophisticated to be looking forward to being reunited with your, with your rotten maggoty corpse. So let's just be done with all that. Well, you know, that might all be fine if God would just go along with it, but God's master plan is not an ethereal world where, you know, people drift around without molecules or membranes, but a, his plan is a grand new earth where his original Eden will be restored. That's the big picture. So to live in such a world, you're going to need a body just as much as Adam did. Well, I don't think I need to stop and convince all of you guys of this. I don't, you, you probably had this idea. Oh, yeah, when you, in the end, we'll be resurrected, we'll have bodies, all of that. Okay. But these people had a problem with that, and so he needs to correct that. And he does that by constructing a logic ladder, a chain of sound reasoning. And what he does is he blows the roof off their false thinking by laying out the logical consequences consequences of denying the resurrection of the dead. And he, so he uses a rhetorical technique called re, reductio ad absurdum. Is that already up there? Okay, so I'm jumping in, but that's okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> let me see if I can describe this easily. Uh, Greg Kukul actually has a, has a whole chapter in this book uh, called Tactics, where he talks of, and he gives advice for when you encounter people that have a different worldview. And one way to get their attention, attention is to temporarily adopt or grant their viewpoint for the sake of argument, and then test drive it in front of them. Now, blowing the roof off is something from Francis Schaeffer. We said, by this, you, you, you take the roof off and you let all the storm come in, all the storm of logic. Like, if you really want to hold that, do you really want to hold that? Let's see where that would lead you. Maybe to places that you never thought of, and maybe places that in the end are disturbing and maybe even absurd. And so that's what he does. He says, okay, well, let's just talk about it this way. Where does that all lead? Can you live with that? And this is what Paul does here. He's saying basically, hey, people, let's assume for the moment that your view is true. There's no resurrection. Do you not realize that your view forfeits the resurrection of Christ, a prime element of the gospel that you treasure? Can you live with that? And if you're hesitant on that at all, let me go even farther, and I will give you a list of things that you most certainly do not want to lose if you lose Christ's resurrection. And so this is the latter of what he's going to go through. So point one is going to be, what if there's no resurrection? And the answer would be, then Christ did not rise, as the gospel says. And then what if Christ did not rise, as the gospel says? You don't want where that leads. So here's the rest of the passage. Beginning in verse 14, he's going to begin to explore what if Christ did not rise as the gospel says. And if Christ has not been raised. Now, Paul knows he was, but, you know, this is for the sake of argument. Um, he's, he's building the logic ladder for them, showing where it all leads, how one bad idea can lead to another bad idea. You, maybe one bad idea didn't seem that bad, but when you realize how bad the other things become, then eventually you say, you know, I need to repent of that and start over. So if Christ has not been raised, which doesn't mean that he was just raised on a certain day uh, that, we, that began Easter, all the Easter Sundays, but that he stays raised. That's the implication of the, of the tense that he uses here. He was raised and he is still risen. He's alive in a resurrected body right this minute. But if somehow that were not true, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. In vain, twice, same word, emphasized, it means empty, hollow, useless, without basis, meaningless, for nothing, worthless, pointless. So here are the first two logical but unacceptable consequences of Christ not being raised. And the first is that the gospel is gutted. Paul means this to shock them. Preaching here refers not to the delivery of the message but to its content. More times than I'd like to admit, I've preached to no effect, even though my orthodoxy was intact. But here it's not talking about bad preaching. It's talking about bad doctrine. We learned last week that the gospel that we received and that they had received was not just that Christ came and died, but that he was also resurrected. And if you take the resurrection out of the whole story, then the story is emptied. That's not enough. So... This empty gospel means that you are caught preaching that Christ died and was raised, even though half of it never happened, if it is true that he did not rise. And it's just plain not enough to save anybody. Any preaching 
that maybe even includes the resurrection, but that it never happened, is vain. It doesn't work. If Jesus was still in the tomb, then death was not defeated, and it doesn't matter what you say about it. Remove the resurrection, and the gospel's got it. Eviscerate it. And if the gospel is gutted, then your faith is gutted too. So that's number two. Your faith is empty, useless. Now, you know, faith is really not any better than its object. Uh, if I come up here and you say, well, sit on this chair, and uh, you haven't told me that it's a collapsible chair and it's not really locked in place, uh, I could depend upon it, but it has to, be, it has to carry my weight, not just because I think it will. It has to be solid. And when you have a dead, unraised Savior, your object stinks, literally. Now, it's a goofy way to think. Our world is just doesn't realize, you know, stools and all of that, I guess. We live in a culture where people often express admiration for people that have faith, in, you know, in something, in anything, in some kind of deity or some cosmic ideas. If faith had value, even if it involves dependence on something that doesn't really exist, people will admire you as a person of faith even though they have no reason to think that you actually, well, that the God you actually believe in actually exists. No, nowadays, it, it really doesn't matter. That is part of postmodernism. Should anyone be admired for praying to and trusting some idol or man-made God that does not objectively exist? Well, people say, why not? You know, as long as you're not hurting anybody and as long as you're not shoving it down somebody's throat like mine, hey, whatever floats your boat. And maybe you know someone who is a follower of the Church of All Worlds. Probably not. I don't think there are too many of them, but it's a neo-pagan religion. It was founded in 1962. Back when I was in high school, I didn't know about it then, but uh, it was founded by Oberon Zell Ravenheart and his sweet little wife, Morning Glory. Uh, these were hippie days, of course. And the re religion really evolved out of fiction. It was inspired by a, a, a fictional novel called Stranger in a Strange Land, which I happened to read in high school by Robert Heinlein. And, and so they recognized Gaia, the mother god, and they had a father god, and they had fairies and deities from all kinds of pantheons. They had rituals that were all built on the gods of Corinth. And following the tradition of using fiction as a basis for his ideas, the founder recently founded a school of wizardry, inspired by Hogwarts School of wizardry and Witchcraft and Wizardry, the school from the Harry Potter novels. Now here's my point in bringing that up. If Jesus was never raised from the dead, your Christian faith is no better than that. It's built on fiction. It's not Hogwarts, it's just hogwash. <laughs> and it's useless as far as eternity is concerned. If you follow a dead Messiah who had no power to finally overcome the, um, the hatred of his enemies and how they arrested, mocked, flogged, nailed, and buried him, then what good is your faith in him? It does not do any good to just say, well, let's believe in him anyway. If you're depending on anything that isn't even true, your faith is useless. That's the second dire consequence if Jesus was not raised. Logical, but not good. Now here's the third. So the gospel is gutted. Help me on this. Gospel is gutted. Your faith is useless. Here's number three. The apostles are frauds. Uh, even though most of them had beards, they were bald-faced liars. I don't even know what that means. What's a bald-faced liar anyway? Uh, whatever. Anyway, so I have to look that up someday. And so in verse uh, 15, we learn this. We, of yeah, that's all of us original eyewitnesses, we are even found or exposed as misrepresenting God. That's we're outed as false witnesses in, because if Jesus didn't rise, we said we saw him. Now, if somebody didn't rise and you go around telling people that you actually walked around and, you know, uh, here was Jesus, and we saw him and did all of this. You're just lying. Uh, and this is a pretty blasphemous lie because it, it says we were, because we testified about God, we misrepresented God. Like swearing with our hands on the Bible that God did something that he did not do. Because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. And he goes back through that. I think he wants to remind them that I'm just doing this for the sake of argument. I don't actually believe this myself. And he ends with this, for if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. So um, this is the logical thing. This is not me talking. This is just the logic. If you believe this, then where does that lead? Now, I'm sure you remember that one essential qualification of an apostle, an apostle was that he was a witness of Christ's resurrection. 
And in fact, at the beginning of chapter 1 of the book of Acts, it says that they spent 40 days with Jesus where he showed himself alive to them with many convincing proofs. And all the way through the book of Acts, they keep preaching Christ, crucified and risen. We saw him, we touched him, we ate with him, we, we saw the nail scars. Now, if they were preaching the resurrection and they were doing that with any kind of detail, like talking about the burial or the, the stone being rolled away or the grave clothes or any of that, you know, or all the appearances, then there's a big problem if it never happened. If there's no resurrection and they kept saying there was, then they're just making it all up. They're a bunch of frauds. Or if they're being deceived by somebody else, then they are gullible and they're stupid on the level of a, a gerbil enrolled in an advanced math class. These are not basically honest, honorable men who are just trying to give hope to people in troubled times. They are just liars. And so if Christ didn't rise, then the gospel is gutted. Your faith is useless. The apostles are frauds. It's all a hoax. And of course, that could mean that you'll be shopping for a new religion, except that there's nowhere else to find life and forgiveness. Like when Jesus said, will you also go away? And Peter said, where else are we going to go? You alone have the words of eternal life. And so where do you find a sufficient sacrifice to satisfy God for your sins if it doesn't come from an infinite sin bearer? And so that's the fourth dire logical consequence. If Christ was not raised, forgiveness is impossible. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Futile, fruitless. Similar to the word empty back in verse 14, but now Paul adds what I'll just call the epic weakness of worthless faith. It cannot get you what you need more than anything a remedy for your sins that separate you from God. You are still in your sins. In other words, you are damned. And you can do nothing about it. If God didn't rise, didn't raise Jesus, and then there, there's no conclusion possible, but that death defeated him. And therefore, we, we have no evidence that what, whatever he was trying to achieve by dying, that it would actually accomplish anything. Because it was not validated by God by raising him from the dead. And so we have to conclude we're still in our sins. We have no assurance that uh, any of our sins were actually put on Jesus' account to be paid for by his substitutionary suffering and that the Father actually received that suffering as sufficient to satisfy him, that the debt of our sins have been paid. And so we must say they are not paid for. That's what Paul is saying. And they're still on us. We are in them, in our sins, they're covering us. That's when God looks at us. That's, that's the sin. What are you going to do about your sin? The wages of sin is what? Death. And so if it was not paid for by Christ, then we will have to pay that hefty price tag ourselves because he did not. Now, if you were thinking that the cross of Jesus by itself ought to be enough to save you from your sins, then you should read Romans 4, 24 and 25. So just mark down this reference here. It's talking about how a righteous standing before God is possible. And he's saying it comes by faith, and it is imputed or given to you, to those of us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was, that's Jesus, was delivered up for our trespasses, that's the cross, and raised for our justification, that's the empty tomb. Now, without stopping for... A, theology lesson on imputation, justification, all that. It's simply saying that you've got to have both the cross and the resurrection or your sins are still on you and you are not declared righteous in God's court. You're still in your sins. That's not good news. You're going to stand trial for all your crimes and misdemeanors that you thought had been paid for eternally. That is the worst news you will ever hear. That is infinitely worse than a nasty letter from the IRS. So if Christ never rose from the dead, <clears throat> uh, the gospel is gutted, your faith is useless, the apostles are frauds, forgiveness is impossible, but there's more. Because if you know people who went to their deaths clutching onto Jesus as their hope of eternal life, you'll never see them again. That's what a bogus gospel, a bogus faith, and a bag full of unatoned for sins get us, eternal separation from God. So if 
Christ was never raised, then dead believers are kaput. All right? And those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Fallen asleep. I mean, we use that term for people that we think we're going to wake up someday. Like, we believe that their bodies will awake to life on that great getting up morning. Fare thee well, fare thee well. But if there is no resurrection of Jesus, then they have died in their sins, and so they have perished. They have gone forever. They're lost and never found. All the fathers, all the mothers of the earth, of the faith, the apostles, the reformers like Luther and Calvin, the great missionaries, and Carey and Judson, they're, they've all perished. They're all in hell, all of them. No resurrection, no reunion. Why? Because they all died wrapped in their infernal sins if Jesus was still in the stone-cold tomb. And now when you begin to absorb all these crushing losses, you begin to feel the emotion behind Paul's conclusion in verse 19. You know, if the gospel we preached with all our hearts isn't true, if we believed it, but we were deceived by people who were frauds, if our guilt is like indelible stains on our hands and all our good friends have died without hope, if all that is true, if that's the case, then here it is. We are of all people most to be pitied. If in Christ we, not just the apostles now, but all of us have hope in this life only, that is, even though we go through our whole lives thinking and believing we're safe, safe in Christ, we have experienced untold days of solace and peace and joy, knowing our security is there, that all of this is certain. But if it turns out that we have been counting on an empty delusion, then what? We are of all people most to be pitied. Not pitied in, like in the way you feel when somebody... <laughs> always insist to you at the beginning of a new baseball season that this is the year the Mariners are going to win it all. Uh, this is pitied in a gut-wrenching way, like the little boy who <laughs> loses his mom into breast cancer and comes home from school every day and sits by himself on the steps in the front porch waiting for mom to come home. Pity like that. Can't believe she's really gone. But she is. We're back to our introductory question, if Christ wasn't raised. Are we worse off and more pathetic than people who end up just as lost, but who never profess to know or believe in Jesus at all? Is there something more pathetic than being lost? I guess that's another way to ask it. And according to Paul, the answer is yes. You think about it, it's not just that we will miss a glorious afterlife. Everyone's going to miss it if Christ never raised or was never raised. If there is salvation only in Christ and he can't save anybody, then all are lost. But this is worse, and this is why Paul wants these people to change their doctrine on the resurrection, because where it ends up is this massive misery. Think about how pitiful, pitiful, or pitiable it is and pitiful to have run your whole life on a delusion or a lie. There's nothing here patting you on the back for finding something that made you happy, even in this life, even though it happened to be a crock. Well... Paul holds out no comfort for that, only pity. And think about how pitiable it is to have spent your whole Christian life peddling hope to people who needed it desperately, but what you told them turns out to be hopeless. And then what fools we are to have even spent our lives in hardship just to perpetuate a fraud. No man of personal solace makes up for that. And I hope, I truly hope that you wouldn't think that your faith in a well-meaning myth has at least... You know, giving you a lot to live for. You know, a better life than others who just live for themselves. Hey, screw your head back on. The only good reason to be sure that living for someone besides yourself is a higher, better value is if Christianity is true. And without a resurrection, you don't know that. In fact, a dead, defeated, unresurrected Jesus is pretty good proof that, that pouring yourself out for others is a fool's choice at best. And so... Wow, to peddle a wonder drug that turns out to be at best nothing but a placebo? What kind of jerks have we been? What a waste. And then think of all the pleasures that you might have set aside in this life because 
You know, hey, we assumed eternal pleasures awaited us. Huh. It's pathetic to end your life thinking your bucket list could have been completed in the new earth and you don't get to go there. You just ran out the clock thinking there'd be another quarter. You know, I'd never seen a game like this where, where a football coach, you know, he was ending the half, but he thought it was the end of a quarter, so he was just letting it run out thinking he would just pick up the ball again. But that's what it's like. You thought there was going to be an eternity following, and then there was not. You waste your life on faithfulness to a dead Jesus. Then you are most to be pitied. Or take a little different slant on this. Pity rains down on us because we have seen and now lost the glorious light, the eternal goodness in the face of Jesus. We have seen what God is like. We have seen ourselves, even our sin, in the light of his glory. We have, we have seen the future and how it might play out with blessings beyond description. And we know even the horror of what it would be like to never see God but be under his wrath. We know all of that. We have seen what no unbelievers are able to see. They can go along in the world blindly and, and, and blissfully without any deep knowledge of what awaits them. They are blind to all of this, but we are not. And so to have all that brought us hope ripped away from us. Can you imagine anything more horrifying than that? A crashing, crushing loss of joy and purpose and of the means to cope well with lives that are difficult for everybody. How do you get the cat back in the bag once you have gotten some glimpse of the enormity of sinfulness? Which you never would have had if you'd never encountered the gospel, even if it turned out to be untrue. It told you something about how horrifying sin is. Now, to be told that you are still in your sins is not that horrifying to someone that has never encountered purity the way God has it. Uh, but a Christian knows the ugliness of sin as something God must judge. He knows God can forgive sin only when sin has been paid for. A Christian knows that he has no excuse for his sins. He also knows that accumulating a lot of good deeds never outweighs them. He knows that even small outward flaws betray big inner gaps of corruption that can cause us to detest even ourselves. It was Pascal who was pretty sure we would lose all of our friends if anyone could read our minds. And from all of this comes a growing longing to be rid of sin. Oh, wretched man that I am. But if you were to learn at the end that there is no balm in Gilead, that there is no procedure for this disease of the soul, there is nothing to do but carry the awful weight of it until the day of your death, then you know what it is to be the most pitied people people on earth. And one more thing, a, an unbeliever may suffer the loss of a loved one with a degree of, I don't know, the mystery that just maybe they have been good enough to get a good afterlife. Or maybe the mourner has stoically made peace with the tyranny of death as a passage into oblivion. It's just like everything will be done, like a spider crushed and gone forever. What can you do about it? The world death rate is holding steady right at 100%. But now here is the Christian bowed low at the graveside of her devout mother, an infant son, and she has been taught to nurture every hope that they will someday be reunited, but then to have that hope torn away. Once it has been cherished as a fact, it would be a shattering experience. And then perhaps it would be that the shortest story ever published in English is also its saddest, for sale. Baby shoes never worn. And those six words are death, loss, brokenness, and an unmet, unmeetable longing. You know, a Christian who loses the reality of the resurrection suffers the pity of learning that this is all there is. This world. After getting a thirst for eternity. And then you must absorb the fact that life is pretty much like drifting in an oarless boat toward Niagara Falls, knowing that you're surely going to die, and then just forcing yourself to enjoy the scenery in the meantime. If there is no forever in Jesus, then all of life's scenery is a cruel and mindless charade. 
Now, perhaps these thoughts help us understand why Paul would say that we are of all people most to be pitied if Jesus did not rise from the dead. But of course, that would only be true if Jesus did not rise. <laughs> and so in the next verse, Paul rushes forward to where, where he longs to take us, and that is to reaffirm the total reverse. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. It's like he's, he's gone as deep as he can, and he can't go any deeper, and he can't stand it anymore, and he just bursts out of the water and just announces it, but re- cancel all of that. It's not, any of it's not true. All of that, it's logical, but it's not true. And this is the glory of the passage that follows, and Nate's going to take us through that next week, the glories of the fact that Christ has been raised. What a great text for Thanksgiving Sunday. But even before we get to that, I think we should pause at the end of this passage and not leave this place until we have put all the cats back in the bag. Sort of like an upbeat country song, you know, where your your dog comes back and your wife comes back and your Chevy pickup doesn't need new rings after all. (laughs) You know, let's see if we can get the absurdum out of the reductio. Because if Christ has been raised, then the gospel is not gutted your faith is not useless. You're, you know, the apostles were not frauds. The, the uh, forgiveness that you need so much is not impossible. Dead Christians are not kaput. And we are not, of all people, most to be pitied. Let's take these one by one. Christ did rise. Therefore, the gospel is not gutted, but it is valid. Because it is based on facts observed and recorded in time space. He both died and he rose. It's the whole gospel the gutted gospel, the whole gospel. We have the great blessing of hearing extraordinary, even supernatural news of something we desperately need, and we would have many rational, common sense excuses to reject it, except that God made sure it was verified by many contemporary witnesses. That's God's gift to us. The news we get is not hollow because it is that full story that he did die. And if you want to know for sure if he died, well, he was buried. After three days, it's pretty sure. And then he was raised, and then we saw him. And it all happened, just as the prophets predicted, and just as Jesus himself predicted. This is the great point of verses 1 to 11. So your gospel is not gutted, and your faith is not useless. Christ did indeed rise, and therefore, number two, therefore your faith is not wishful thinking. It is based on facts. The gospel is not some pretty story. To, to make you feel better. You know, people sometimes patronize Christians by sort of patting us on the back as if we were morons on meds who are sort of beyond remedy. We aren't worth the trouble. They apply a bit of popular wisdom, and I, this, I would apply this in certain situations. A quote, trying to convince a delusional person that their delusions aren't real is a futile effort. If their delusions are harmless and make them happy, then just let them be. And I think a lot of people think that about Christians. Listen to Kathy Keller from a Gospel Coalition blog. If believing in Jesus is what gets you through the day, as many a skeptic has told me, then good for you. We all have our lucky rabbit's foot to comfort us. If Jesus is yours, then fine. Just don't push it on me. And then she says this. The problem with this argument is that our faith is in things Jesus did. It's not the way we feel about them. It's not the effect on us. It's actual things he did. And if he didn't do them, then the whole thing is useless. The Christian places his faith, her hope of renewal, his confidence in forgiveness, in the actions of someone else in Jesus Christ. And if he didn't live as he lived, died as he died, and rise as he promised, then we Christians are spending our lives chasing a fairy tale, childish, stupid, pitiable. But if he did live as he lived, if he did die as he died, if he did rise as he rose, then our faith is grounded in history. And we know that because of the reliability of the first witnesses. Jesus actually did rise. Therefore, number three, the apostles told the truth about what God did in raising Christ. It's not true because they said it. It is They said it because it's true. Now, how else can you possibly explain how one by one they died for the resurrection message that they preached? Well, why would they? Would to a man do that for a lie, would you? And wouldn't at least one of them crack and break down and confess that they had perpetuated a hoax? 
certainly as they stared at the instruments of their torment and execution. The only real, you know, only a real resurrection could explain why they didn't. And here is something almost no unbelievers understand, and that is the simple fact that the resurrection is not a convenient truth. It gets us into trouble in a world of skeptics. It sends us to places where we suffer. So we believe the gospel, not because it helps us or soothes us. We believe it because it's true. Even when it feels like it's not working for us. This, in fact, is a great glory. To have truth that is independent of your personal enjoyment of it, it's that kind of robust, bigger than you and your feelings truth that can actually save you when you need saving most. When your feelings fail you, the facts do not. Jesus has been raised from the dead. And therefore, number four, your sins are forgiven. Can you say anything more powerful to another person's soul than that? You've done wrong. You deserve to die. (laughs) But your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. Only a living, resurrected Christ could make good on the promise of eternal forgiveness. I love the verse in Romans 8. Who is to condemn you? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. And so this living Savior who prays for us, make sure that we do not fail, that we are never condemned, that our sins cannot bring us down. And it's because he has risen indeed. And then number five, therefore you will see your Christian loved ones again. Wow. Wow. Hey, in a few short days, my wife, BJ, will be the exact age my mom was when she died of cancer. And I can't imagine losing her so young. But it could happen. But look, we have hope because Christ was raised, so will we both. Sheldon Van Alken was a student of the great C.S. Lewis and studied with him in the 1950s. It came time for him to for uh, Van Alken, who was from the U.S., to to, to leave England and go back home. And so he had a final lunch together with C.S. Lewis, and they were having a great time. In fact, they were talking about the nature of the life after death. And they finished eating. They stood outside, talked for a few four minutes, and four or five minutes, and then before parting, Lewis said to Van Alken, I shan't say goodbye. We'll meet again. Now, I don't know if he said that to everybody, but Van Elken remembered that. And then the great apologist uh, plunged into the traffic across the street while Van Elken just watched his friend walk away for the last time. And when Lewis got to the other side, you thought I was going to say the car hit him, but that's not it. <laughs> when Lewis got to the other side of the street, he, he, he turned, anticipating uh, may, maybe his friend might still be standing there. And with a grin on his face, Lewis shouted over the great roar of the cars, Besides, Christians, never say goodbye. What a great thing to think about. What's the bottom line to all of this? If Christ has been raised and you believe in him, you are of all people most to be envied. I totally love that thought. It might be hard being a Christian in this world. I mean, it is. We were made for another world. We were made for Eden. We are often looked down on in an age of skeptics, but when the truth is known, you are of all people most to be envied, not pitied. Look what you have because you have a Savior who has been raised from the dead. You know ultimate things for sure. You have damnable sins that are forgiven forever. You know that you are okay with God for all eternity. You are assured that what you know of this life in small portends a large and glorious reality that will never end. It's like all the, well, this is what Steve DeWitt said. He said, this world and its history are prelude and foretaste. All the sunrises and sunsets, symphonies and rock concerts, feasts and friendships are but whispers. They're a prologue to the grander story in an even better place. Only there it will never end. J.R. Packer said it so well. Hearts on earth say in the course of a joyful experience, I don't want this ever to end. 
but invariably does. The hearts in heaven say, I want this to go on forever. And then it will. There can be no better news than this. Only Christians have that kind of hope. It is what sustains us. It's what curious onlookers sometimes see in us when they, they ask us for a reason for the hope that is in us. This is from 1 Peter 3. And we have the humble privilege of giving a defense, an explanation for why we are incurable hopers that we have a risen Savior who defeated sin, death, and hell and loves us forever. So come on in. The water's fine. (laughs) Come on in. This loving, living Savior is amazing. And there above all is the greatest thing about having a living Savior is that you know him in the present tense. In fact, the joy of man's desire is here right now. Now, even acceptance of your vulnerability, your, your lostness, is to be envied because it is the humiliating truth you try so hard to tamp down and hide because of pride. But it is so freeing to admit your need of God when you finally humbly embrace your brokenness. Let me end by talking about Nicole Cliff. She became a Christian Uh, Just a short time ago, July 7th, 2015, after what she called a very pleasant adult life of firm atheism. In fact, she writes this in an article called How God Messed Up My Happy Atheist Life. And so she wrote this, "The, the idea of a benign deity who created and loved us was obviously nonsense and all that awaited us beyond the grave was joyful oblivion. I had no untapped, unanswered yearnings, but here's how she describes what happened to her. First, I was worried about my child. One time I said, be with me, to an empty room. It was embarrassing. I didn't know why I said it or to whom. I brushed it off. I I moved on. The situation resolved itself. I didn't think about it again. Second, I came across John Ortberg's uh, CT, or Christianity Today, obituary for philosopher Dallas Willard. John's daughters are dear friends and they have always struck me as sweetly deluded in their evangelical faith. So I read the article, and in it she learned this. Somebody once asked Dallas if he believed in total depravity, and he said, well, I believe in sufficient depravity. He said this, I believe that every human being is sufficiently depraved that when we get to heaven, no one will be able to say, I merited this. A few minutes into reading the piece, I burst into tears. Later that day, I burst into tears again, and the next day, and while brushing my teeth, and while falling asleep, while in the shower, while feeding my kids, I would burst into tears. She read some Christian books, and every time she cried all over again, she emailed a Christian friend and asked if she could talk about Jesus, and she writes, but about an hour before our call, I knew I believed in God. Worse, I was a Christian. (laughs) I was crying constantly while thinking about Jesus because I had begun to believe that Jesus really was who he said he was. And so when my friend called, I told her awkwardly that I wanted to have a relationship with God, and we prayed. And since then, I have been dunked by a pastor in the Pacific Ocean while shivering in a too small wetsuit. I have sung Be Thou My Vision and celebrated communion on a beach while weirded out Californians tiptoed around me. I go to church. I pray. Even after accepting Christ, I continued to cry a lot. I read a news article that literally sank me to my knees at how broken this world is, and yet how stubbornly resilient and joyful we can be in the face of that brokenness. My Christian conversion has granted me no simplicity. It has complicated all of my relationships, changed how I feel about money, messed up my public persona. Obviously, obviously, It's been very beautiful how God messed up my happy atheist life. Nicole is now among the messed up people of this world who are most to be envied. Are you? Let's pray. Lord God, this is our lot in life. 
to have a Savior, your Son, alive, resurrected, resurrected body, something that is amazing. And if Jesus lives, so shall we. We believe in him. We sing of him. We honor him. We mimic him wherever we can. We have hope. We have gobs of hope because it's all true. Thank you. In Jesus' great name, amen.